Bonjour madame. Vous savez la place pour deux personnes aujourd'hui S'il vous plaît. So you just dial the numbers you see in the house followed by the green button and you listen like the phone. All right. Okay? And once you finish before leaving the house, you will see on the right hand side a wooden box. Just drop them. Perfect. Oh, okay. okay. Right. This way to the gardens. Thank you so Enjoy much. See you room. later. Kerylos means a kingfisher, also known as the halcyon bird in Greek mythology. And my house sits on the sea like the nest of this fabled bird. I've been charmed by this view ever since I first discovered the fishing village perched on the headland of the Pointe des Fourmis. It reminded me so much of a Greek landscape, with the endless blue of the sea, the sun, and the rocks. And there were so few buildings here, apart from the extensive villa built by Gustave Eiffel over to our left. But his villa has nothing antique about it. Together with my architect, Emmanuel Pontremoli, we are the only people to have recreated in minute detail a replica of a Greek villa from the second century BC. But don't go thinking it is just a slavish copy. It is a contemporary work of art, but one steeped in archaeological references, because the Greek spirit is neither contradictory to the life nor the habits of our own times. However, unlike those ancient dwellings, Villa Kerylos was not designed to be inward-looking around its inner courtyard. It was meant to take full advantage of the sun. I sometimes tell myself that this gushing water running beneath the mosaic half-dome of my bathing room of Panathéon is where my ambition to recreate a corner of ancient Greece is most successful. The lighting is a great help. The thermal baths were an essential part of the ancient Greek culture. The impression here is so strong that you can almost see the steam from the ancient baths and the flames of the torches. That said, you did sacrifice to the god electricity of Kalos, and to many other things as well. But modernity has to be unobtrusive. The bell pushes to some of the servants, like the one near the door in this room, a tiny. There's plenty of running hot water, but the water heater is carefully hidden in the basement. And what can I say about the water supply for this bar? It empties and fills through the star-shaped bronze plug hole in the center. The water's flow and temperature are controlled by taps hidden behind the grills on either side of the staircase. However, eminently Greek algae and sea creatures people its depths. Its octagonal form is that of a classical Christian baptistry. You can immerse yourself in water to a depth of a meter. The Balanaeon is dedicated to the water nymphs, or naeans. I had the name inscribed above the door, as you can see. The stucco on the ceiling is as white as ever, and the striped Carrara marble is exactly how I remember it. But the wall hangings are different. They used to be pink throughout Kerylos, but now they look sepia to me. 
perhaps it's the salt in the air, or the heat of the climate. Or perhaps it is no more than the march of time, my dear Monsieur Pontemoli. March of time. If you'd like to hear more about bathing traditions in ancient Greece, press the green button. style. I find the word alone enchanting. It was the essence of a Greek home, and for me, the essence of Kerylos too. It takes me back to all those lively discussions near this oleander that was planted when the house was built. I delight in walking in this courtyard. Kerylos would not have had a Greek soul without a central courtyard open to the sky. In antiquity, all the rooms in the house would open onto the peristyle. But my own house has taken a few liberties with ancient Greek architecture. The rooms do not all open onto the courtyard, and the columned arcades to protect one from the bad weather only extend on three sides. That's correct. To the west, we decided to build a simple wall that allowed us to provide more space for the garden on this narrow headland. But the elegant palmettos closing off the lowest tiles along the edge of the roof, and known as antifixes, are copies of those on the Acropolis in Athens, while the 12 Carrara marble columns are in the Doric order. They are all it takes to give your courtyard a noble aspect. The Roman architect Vitruvius felt that the Doric order was masculine, and that Ionic columns like the pair one walks between coming into the entrance hall with their delicacy and voluted capitals are a more feminine expression. I do not give much scientific credence to the principle. But there you are. We're in a family home where men and women need to live alongside each other in harmony. As a result, I also gave in to this agreeable distribution. This place seems made for study with its sundial and verse couplet that says Για να βλέπει ο καθένας στον τοίχο ορατό από μακριά, ποια είναι για αυτόν η ώρα της εργασίας και εκείνη της ανάπαυσης. So that all, on the wall visible from afar, may see what is for them, the time for work and the time for rest. Facing west, as if to complement the one on the outside facing the east, the sundial only shows the time in the afternoon, do you ever rest, Monsieur Renac? that I rather took umbrage at your refusal to use my designs for the peristyle. But you didn't want large scenes painted on a red background that reminded you of the Pompeian villa built for Prince Jérôme Napoleon in Paris. When I see the final result here, painted by Gustave Louis Jolme and Adrien Karbowski, I can only concur. I preferred to have frescoes that blended in with the Carrara marble, with more diluted colours, so that they resembled the decor on Lekithoi, those elegant, tall Greek vessels that I am very fond of. You decode Greece with a paintbrush in your hand. When Jaume mixed his colors and reproduced ancient techniques, he was working as an archaeologist. For centuries, people dug in the earth to exhume the past. In my case, I built Kerylos to understand it. My house is a practical exercise in experimentation and demonstration, a sort of reverse excavation, if you will. For the frescoes, I chose simple subjects, forgotten legends, inspired by vases in museums in Berlin, Munich, and the Vatican. 
Legends like that of the death of Talos on the West Wall. We see him here, dying in the arms of Castor and Pollux. The Dioscuri for trying to stop Jason and the Argonauts from landing on Crete. On the East Wall, Pelops and Hippodamia are riding triumphantly in the center on a four-horse chariot or quadriga before making preparations for their wedding in the right-hand section. To win the hand of Hippodamia, Pelops had to compete with the young woman's father, Enemaeus, in the chariot race you can see on the left. You are aware, I'm sure, that Pelops was the founder of the Olympic Games, organized on Mount Olympus in honor of the gods. The gods. They swing back and forth so often between grace and cruelty. The twelve Olympian gods and their semi-divine descendants are never entirely good, never entirely evil. Just like ordinary mortals, my dear Mr. Pontremoli. library faces east, as prescribed by the Roman architect Vitruvius. This allows one to work in the morning light and to avoid exposing the books to the humid breezes from the south and west. I've always devoted the morning hours to study. I use one of these two desks in front of the window, writing and reading in a standing position in the antique manner. Here I continue my study of ancient Greek and keep abreast of world affairs. The room is very finely proportioned with this elevation over one and a half stories, forming a gallery to house your documents. But my thoughts go to the furnishings as I design them down to the very last peg. The chests, first of all, which form the main items of furniture in a Greek household. And then these two large tables with their antique profile feet for consulting documents. The ancient Greeks designed them with three legs to guarantee their stability, 
on what were often beaten earth floors. Of course, that was not a problem here, with this beautiful mosaic floor showing Hera in the center with Prometheus, unless she is with Dionysus. Here again, my preference did not go to Greece. You had these two remarkable Roman chairs made for me, which are copied from the ones in the Louvre. And there is the large bronze chandelier, which is entirely Byzantine. Yet all this is under the gaze of an entire ancient Greek pantheon. Placed on the chests are reproductions of a helmeted Athena and of well-known bronzes from the museum in Naples. I must like to know they're near me when I'm studying. Just like the names of the greats of ancient Greece, which I had inscribed in the medallions around the room. The couplet written on the north and south walls is there to confirm this. Ethel. Με συντροφιά τους ρήτορες, τους σοφούς και τους Έλληνες ποιητές απολαμβάνω μια ειρηνική απομόνωση μες στην αθάνατη ομορφιά. Here, in the company of the Greek orators, philosophers and poets, have I created this peaceful haven in immortal beauty. If you'd like to hear more about the villa's lighting system, press the green button now. It was, of course, out of the question that Kerylos should be deprived of the benefits of electricity. But the chief difficulty was to avoid making a show of amenities that would disrupt the ancient Greek atmosphere that we were seeking for the house. To light their own interiors, the Greeks mainly used lamps burning vegetable oil, to which they added a little salt. The wicks were made from tau, papyrus, or the castor oil plant. To recreate their flickering light at Kerylos, I wanted to hide modern light bulbs behind shades made of opaline, alabaster, or openwork bronze. The library has a few of these creations, with alabaster lamps with three burners placed in tall torches, or horn reflecting lamps. In the more modest parts of the house, I used a fair amount of terracotta. The Byzantine chandelier, with its many small opaline glass lights, along with the matching sconces, is partly inspired by medieval mosques. The heating system is coal-fired, with the heat coming from under the floor through grills set into the mosaics. This amphitheron is little more than a hallway used to gain access to the library and the dining room, and yet it has a special mysterious atmosphere that makes one want to linger here. Perhaps it's the presence of your impressive cast of Athena Lemnia, a copy of the bronze statue by Phidias, the great Athenian artist who was the brightest star of the 5th century BC. Do you not see the irony in my choice of this statue? The original has lost its arms and its spear, and the recreations are the fruit of hypotheses by the German archaeologist Adolf Furtwängler. It is my way of paying tribute to a rival scholar. A fine lesson in modesty. But is this rendition of Athena even credible? She has sparked many a controversy, and so reminds me every day that we are all fallible. The openwork panels set into the staircase ensure that the cool of the fountain reaches the rooms above, as we should not forget that the house has several stories, with bedrooms for the children, servants' quarters, and a Belvedere tower. This fountain is meant to do more than cool the air. 
the ancient Greeks would use such fountains to wash their feet after removing their sandals and before reclining on couches to eat. But before we talk about banqueting, would you be so kind as to show me into your library to revive the memories of my research? I note that all the rooms in the house have Greek names. All except the library. But my dear Mr. Pontremoli, the French word for library, bibliothèque, already derives from the Greek, which only goes to show that when it comes to study and reading, the French are still a little Greek at heart. Your designs, my dear Monsieur Pontremoli, made Kerylos the special place it is, and I never tire of looking at them. If I look at the tableware in the triclinos, or dining room, I can only congratulate you on the elegance and remarkable freedom with which, to create it, you took inspiration from an expanded ancient repertory. The everyday objects in use at Kerylos are a perfect match for their surroundings, and such ingenious adaptations too. Forks had yet to be invented in the time of ancient Greeks, and they ate with their fingers. But you managed to invent some extremely plausible silverware, executed to your designs by the house of Le Verrier. And the crockery is stoneware by Émile Lenoble, so it is not as fragile as the terracotta used by the Greeks. While the glassware is Venetian, the luxurious brilliance of crystal would have struggled to conjure up antiquity. The furniture, however, is a recreation of the ancient Greek art of banqueting, based on copies taken from antique ceramics and on findings from my own research. The three tables are placed according to the ancient plan. The banqueting couch, a little higher than the others, allowed the master of the house to preside over the meal. The execution is extremely delicate and is the work of the Bettenfeld Workshop, an English cabinet maker working in Paris. I took great pains with my designs to specify the materials I wanted used. Rosewood and lemon wood with ivory inlays. Dining in a reclining position was not a very ancient custom among the Greeks. For this single daily meal, we know from the evidence found on carved bas-relief that previously they had dined on chairs. At any rate, neither I nor my family ever sacrificed to the reclining ritual. We sat down to eat in a highly conventional manner, surrounded by this frieze of the Silenoi, who personify inebriation alongside Dionysus. The food was sent up to the dining room using this dumb waiter near the door, leading to the stairs down to the kitchen. This room, like many of the others, is decorated with a floor mosaic. If you'd like to hear more about the villa's mosaics, press the green button now. With a floor area of some 1,700 square meters, Kerylos had ample space for an extremely rich and varied repertory of mosaics executed by Italian craftsmen to designs by Monsieur Pontremoli and borrowed from the great museums in Italy and elsewhere. While Monsieur Pontremoli drew abundant inspiration from a variety of ancient models, it is worth noting that several of these mosaics are similar to those discovered in the noble houses on Delos, especially when they included depictions of dolphins, an emblematic creature on this sacred island. The ancient Greeks used mosaics to decorate the floors in noble houses, temples, and palaces. They used a variety of materials such as pebbles, terracotta, stone, and marble. At Kerylos, the mosaics are made from small cubes of colored stone called tesserae, with which our craftsmen, recreating patient, immemorial gestures dating back to antiquity, paved the floors. In so doing, they laid out under our feet a gentle, changing, multicolored palette that contrasts pleasantly with a somewhat austere architectural style.
So here we are in the Kerolos reception room, the finest room in the house, with its walls lined with prestigious Italian marbles, such as peach blossom marble from Serravezza and the yellow marble from Siena. Even if I know that the room rarely hosts festivities, it does light up on some evenings. In antiquity, the Andron was the men's lounge where they went to converse together. But I imagine that the ladies were welcome too. Kerolos does not have a gynaeum, the quarters reserved for the women of the household in ancient Greek society. It is true that we occasionally moved the Greek furniture and replaced it with tables on reception days. I must confess that the candlelight reflected on my bronzes is extremely flattering. Here you have two bronzes, one of an Amazon and the other of Alexander the Great, copied from originals in the museum at Naples. The silver crater was made by the silversmith Christophe and is a perfect copy of a first century BC vase. Craters were used for adding water to the wine at the start of a meal and this one is especially opulent. They were usually made of terracotta, bronze or stone. The imposing throne, however, was the fruit of your inspiration alone. I based the design on what I saw on Greek vases, but with its bronze arms supported by sphinxes, it also borrows a little from Egypt. It's the remarkable central mosaic showing Theseus slaying the Minotaur in the center of the labyrinth that, to my mind, imbues this reception room with its grandeur. You are forgetting, perhaps, that it is above all the domestic altar in Carrara marble that identifies the Andron as the main room in the house. The Greeks left their offerings to the gods here. My altar is inscribed Agnosto Theo, meaning to the unknown god. St. Paul is said to have seen this inscription on an altar in Athens when he preached the coming of Christ to the Athenians. I'm aware that this choice is original, to say the least. For someone who is not a Christian and subscribes to the religion of Israel, but you should see it in the profound universalist concern that has never ceased to drive me on. The God of all men is perhaps yet to be discovered. simply means house and yet this room plays an essential role in the life of this particular house we designed the oikos as an intimate lounge area where the family could gather surrounded by lemon wood furniture the bas-relief depict the main episodes in the legend of Dionysus a character who is much in evidence in Kerolos this was perhaps due to my interest in Nietzsche who made Dionysus an archetype 
in his The Birth of Tragedy. Theatre is never far off, in fact, with the frieze of antique masks lining the walls. It was almost omnipresent in Greek society, as you well know, as was music. Observe the stucco frieze with its lyres, citherers, and tambourines, and also the aulos, the double reed instrument characteristic of the cult of Dionysus. And I know that you know Greek musical notation, and it is to you that we owe the melodic reading of a hymn to Apollo discovered in Delphi and its transcription into modern musical notation. My good friend Gabriel Fauré did me the honor of performing it in Paris in 1897. I would love to work with other musicians too. I see myself as a librettist drawing on ancient texts to rekindle the voices of the ancient world. Along with Henri Weil, the Greek scholar, I'm also interested in translating a treatise on Greek music by Plutarch. Playing music is a huge pleasure for me, but I'm abstaining from devoting my time to the lyre or the aulos. I content myself with the piano, often alone or surrounded by the composers whose company I enjoy. And even the piano, so very un-Greek, was hidden in a specially designed tall chest. If you'd like to hear more about it, press the green button. There is a genuine magic of the entrance hall at Kerylos. The terracotta chandelier imparts a soft, intimate light in this Hermes entrance hall that leads to the upper floor of private apartments. It is exactly symmetrical with the amphitryon below, and it really is Hermes who welcomes you here, not the divinity himself, but a sculpture, a herm, that bears his name. In other words, a bust sitting on top of a quadrangular pillar that often serves as a boundary marker, marking a crossroads or limits of a property or a threshold. And as you can see, we stand here on the threshold of the most private area of the house, do we not? Herms were also fertility symbols and were believed to keep harmful influences at bay. Anyone who moved a herm could be sentenced to death. This one flanked by two elegant ionic columns in white stucco, is dedicated to Dionysus and is a copy of a work by the sculptor Bithos. The original was raised from the seabed off Tunisia along with a young Eros, and I also had a cast made of him, which now stands on a pillar close by. His ridicula, the structure sheltering the herm, is inspired by the sanctuary of Athena Polyas in Pergamon. For me, the way the niche stands up against the wall is in every respect reminiscent of a Roman lararium, a small shrine to the household gods. In the center, as I saw when I was in Pompeii, you will often find a family ancestor. I like to think, my dear Monsieur Renac, that Dionysus could have been an ancestor of yours. 
delighted, I'm sure. Since this villa was originally designed as a holiday home, perhaps you would like to hear more about how the family spent their holidays. If so, press the green button now. but I only ever stayed here when my other duties permitted. My usual home was in Paris, where, in addition to my parliamentary duties, I was tied up with meetings of the various institutions I worked with, such as the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, a learned society devoted to the humanities. But Kerylos was more than just a whimsical exercise of style, or a jewel I own for the sheer spiritual pleasure of it. Kerylos is also a living house where my family settled after an interminable journey by automobile from Paris, even if, at first sight, the simple forms of the furnishings may suggest a lack of comfort. I cannot deny that the beds, with their thin mattresses supported by metal bands or leather straps, elicited many a complaint from my family, as did the central heating system, which never really satisfied our expectations but had the merit of being invisible. There were no fireplaces in ancient Greece. Our days at Kerylos revolve around study in the mornings and meals, which I insist should be at fixed times. They are often prolonged by conversation, but often, after a meal, I open the doors of my library to family members and guests. There, we play parlor games with my children, such as drafts, chess, charades or anagrams. I have even created my own set of happy families, writing the names of 19th century writers. The Ornithes, or bird room, is named after the peacocks and swans disporting themselves in the upper part of the central wall. While swans are also embroidered on the wall hangings among the palms, you wanted the most beautiful bedroom to be Madame Renax. It overlooks the sea towards Italy. The bedroom has a very feminine atmosphere, with its ionic columns dividing it into two parts, creating an alcove around the bed. The frescoes are based on the sort of interior scenes found on Greek pottery. The ladies are trying on jewelry, doing their hair, or putting on sandals assisted by their maids. The bedroom is all done out in inlaid lemon wood, right down to the marquetry chests used to store linen. It is much like the past. In the gynoseum, where the women would weave their clothes and store them in large chests. But Madame Renac had a small adjoining room that she used as a wardrobe. And her chests contain large numbers of books. She hardly ever comes into my library, as she has her own store of works. Since you mentioned maids, I should say that although Madame Renac was not surrounded by an army of servants fit for a queen, we nevertheless had a sufficiency of domestic help for a home of this standing. There are five bedrooms in the servants' quarters on the ground floor. They're modest in size, but the furniture is also in the Greek style, although in oak in this case. Kerylos has an apparent unity of style, but boasts an infinite variety in the details, created by your own hand, Monsieur Pontremoli. Almost 280 items of furniture can be found under this roof, and all are works of art. You have created a style, my dear sir. This very feminine bedroom was Fanny Renax. If you'd like to hear more about her, press the green button now. when I was 29 and struggling to adjust to the loss of my first wife, Evelyn, who left us far too soon. Fanny and Evelyn were cousins, so our families were fated to be united, I suppose. When Fanny became Madame Renac, I also found myself related by marriage to the Efrusi family. My wife is the great niece of Moïse Efrusi, who, with his wife, Beatrice de Rothschild, had their grand pink villa built almost at the same time as Kerylos 
Uncap Ferrat, which you can espy from the windows of this bedroom. Fanny was also a niece of Charles Efroussi, the part owner of France's leading art magazine, the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, who had made Fanny his sole heir. Fanny's personal fortune largely contributed to the considerable expense of building Kerios. So this house is entirely hers. I feel immense gratitude. The name of Madame Renek's bathroom in no way refers to ablutions. Ampilos means grapevine. Stucco scenes of the grape harvest dominate the decor, showing women wearing long chiton, long, delicately pleated tunics. There are also other motifs similar to those seen in the Oikos. Eros playing among dolphins, a panther, a leaping goat, a ram, and so on. These were executed by my sculptor friend, Paul Gasque, who took his inspiration from a visit to the Diocletian Baths Museum in Rome. But the white marble bathtub, with its claw feet and lion-headed taps, is equally imposing in its own way, don't you think? And dare I allude to the shape of the bidet? It is hidden away in a specially designed chest next to the bathtub. The front opens and the bidet slides out on a little wooden platform. It's far too contemporary an artifact to be permanently on show, as is the large mirror hidden behind the sliding panels on the doors. In ancient Greece, mirrors were no more than a sheet of polished metal, allowing only a blurred reflection. Although that did not stop elegant ladies from lightening their complexions with white lead, derived from lead carbonate, and giving themselves rosy cheeks using vermilion or hematite, and outlining their eyes with black. For the ancient Greeks in the classical period, however, beauty was essentially masculine and consisted of a perfectly proportioned body achieved through the practice of gymnastics. Feminine beauty was less natural and more rooted in the flesh and in cosmetics and hence devalued. Philosophers and the authors of theatrical comedies often describe the art of makeup. If you'd like to hear more about this bathroom and in particular its shower, press the green button now. Ah, Monsieur Pontremoli, you must be delighted. Here we are in the Triptolim, a long-awaited return to the island of Delos. The mosaic in this room takes its borders, laid out in concentric circles, from the courtyard of the so-called House of the Dolphins on Delos. But this private room I share with Madame Renac equidistant from our bedrooms and situated between the two bathrooms actually takes its name from the central motif of the mosaic. The image of the demigod Treptolemus is reproduced after a bowl in the Vatican Museum. The goddess Demeter has presented Treptolemus with a winged chariot harnessed to serpents embodying the spirits of the earth so that he can spread the gift of agriculture around Greece. It was to Triptolemus that Demeter presented the first ear of wheat and the first plowshare. How delightful it must be to read in this room, Monsieur Renac, with the bucolic pergola depicted in the wall frescoes, reminiscent of villas in Pompeii. You must almost feel as if you are sitting in a garden. We even ate luncheon here on occasion, when I did not have time enough to do the honours of the dining room. The servants would bring me up some food, which I ate on the polished silver tray on that bronze table there. The tray could also be used as a Greek-style mirror. The elegant coffered ceiling decorated with birds, flower garlands, and checkered patterns is reflected in it when I take my meals here. If you'd like to become better acquainted with the Renac couple, please press the green button now. bathroom is the symmetrical pendant of Madame Renax. It contains the Carrara marble bathtub, which weighs, I believe, over a ton. In your case, 
you plumped for those graceful taps with swan's necks and dolphin heads. The stucco work is again by Paul Gasque, whom I met at the Villa Medici, a French academy in Rome, when I was a resident there. Stucco is a difficult art form, which entails mixing marble powder with plaster and then sculpting the paste like the relief of a medal, so as to make the muscles vibrant and encourage the play of light on the bodies, as we can see over the door in these scenes of young men at their toilet. The anatomies are copied from the famous Ephronius Crater. Notice also the victories, or Nikai, who gave this room its name. They are the winged young women connected by garlands of ivy and holding laurel branches. The medallions depict figures of Eros, as in Madame Renac's bathroom, as well as a wineskin, a sort of spear, or thyrsus, or staff, and a woman shown in profile wearing a typical cacryphalos or hairnet. Here you will see no mirrors, hidden or otherwise. You remain a purist in your own private quarters, Monsieur Renac. Maybe too private, perhaps. But of course, nothing is more intimate than one's bathroom. I have to confess something, though. It is whispered that Kerlos is a masterpiece, the last word in contemporary architecture that reconciles history and modernity. Many people would like to visit it, and someday, I'm sure that will happen. You have hit the nail on the head, dear sir. When I die, I want to bequeath the house to the Institute. Its members will know how to preserve it and open it one day to the public. I love to receive my children, nephews and nieces in my bedroom. They are like this frieze of small Eros figures fluttering around the upper part of the walls. The Cupids to whom I have dedicated this room which I dubbed Erotes. But wisdom and war are also present with these three figures of Athena. The dominant color of the room is red, which was characteristic of the Greek color palette. And like the feminine Ornithes, your bedroom, the Erotes, is split in two by columns, although in this case they are Doric columns. They are used to hang the curtains that form two alcoves, one on either side of the bed. One alcove leads to a corridor with many service doors to allow the servants access to the different rooms on this floor. We took great care to inscribe on the doors the poetic names you chose to define the spaces in Kerylos. The mosaic in your bedroom is especially beautiful. It again shows Dionysus sailing the Tyrrhenian pirate ship alone, while the pirates Dionysus had turned into dolphins disport themselves in the sea. The scene is copied from one on a bowl in the museum in Munich. And here we have the bed where Theodor Renac dreamed his dreams. I wanted this bronze and curved wood bed copied from an original found in Pompeii. But since you mentioned dreams, it is fair to say that there seems to be a desire these days for dream homes. Just think of Edmond Rostand's Villa Arnaga in the Basque country. And Louis XVI's mansion, built by the Camondo in Paris. Not to mention the dozen or so extravagant villas that have sprung up along the coast between Nice and Monaco. But Kerylos is not just a dream. It's also a place of scholarly rigor, and I shall never stop praising you for having created it exactly to my wishes. I cannot allow you to leave without quoting these lines by the Greek philosopher Lucian of Somersata. It was a seabird named Kerylos, or Halcyon. The gods rewarded it for its tenderness. While the Halcyon birds raise their young, the world basks in remarkable days. Today is one such day. Look, the weather is still. The sea is calm, without waves, like a mirror. <laughs> Ονομάζεται Κυρίλος, ανταμύφθηκε για τη στοργή του από τους θεούς. Όσο εγκολάπτει τους νεοσούς του, 
Ο κόσμος ζει αξιοσημείωτες ημέρες. Είναι σήμερα μία από αυτές τις μέρες. Κοίτα, ο καιρός είναι γαλήνιος. Η θάλασσα είναι ήρεμη, χωρίς κύματα. Και μοιάζει με καθρέφτη.